That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Arcadian, the third film directed by Benjamin Brewer, which premiered at the 2024 South by Southwest Film Festival. It is being released courtesy of RLJE Films on April 12th, 2024. Do I know a Benjamin Brewer film? No, uh, uh, but I do recommend his 2016 sophomore film, The Trust, uh, which also starred Nicolas Cage and Elijah Wood. I, I did think that was uh, quite an entertaining film. I think it's notable to mention that he also worked on the visual effects of Everything Everywhere All at Once. Oh, wow. What is this movie about? A father and his twin teenage sons fight to survive in a remote farmhouse at the end of the world. What's your pull quote? Despite some inspired creature creations, Brewer's post-apocalyptic survival thriller is both vague and derivative, its narrative unable to support its nightmarish vision to be properly effective. Mine. Arcadian doesn't add anything new to the post-apocalyptic pile. Yeah, I feel like I've seen this movie done in various iterations. Um, it, it, I, except for maybe its title, which uh, is, I think, supposed to be ironic since Arcadian is a real or imaginary place that's a uh, peaceful, uh, peaceful environment. I mean, Arcadia was also a mountainous region in ancient Greece, but, and, and there's a, a very famous uh, play by Tom Stoppard called Arcadia and a Greek film from last, what, well, this year that I saw in Berlin called Arcadia. I think Arcadia is also a city in San Gabriel Valley, but... <laughs> I think it's most a, a, a peaceful place. The story is very simple. Nicolas Cage plays this guy who has two sons who he found. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so no, I don't think they're his. The film opens with Nicolas Cage running in an environment that seems like maybe it was the start of the end of the world. Like maybe there was war happening like the quiet place day one yeah kind of that vibe and then he just runs into like a cave and finds two little babies wrapped up mm -hmm. so it all feels very random and then we jump to 15 years later and we see nicholas cage with two teenage sons and the boys are played by um, Thomas is Maxwell Jenkins, who uh, was the brother in Joe Bell. He's also uh, Will Robinson in the Lost in Space Netflix series. Oh. Uh, and then Joseph is played by Jaden Martell of the uh, It films. So it's like a lot of these movies where they're like in a remote area, just doing their routine from day to day, when we realize that in the evening, there's something trying to get into the house. And... We realize that there are these creatures that, I thought they looked like sick black bears. Yeah, they look like there's something kind of wrong with them. And there's, I, I think the first two times we see the creatures are very chilling, yes. very effective. And then it turns out that the face that we're seeing on them initially is really kind of like the same mechanism, mechanism used for the, what are those things called? The wheelers. The wheelers in Return to Oz, where it's like a fake out. So I thought the creatures were interesting, but they're, they're not as destructive as, let's say, the creatures in A Quiet Place. Mm -hmm. Because we see several characters get attacked by them, and the humans are able to fight off <laughs> these creatures. But the, I was confused by a lot, because first of all, we don't know what caused the condition that the world is in, in the moment we see this film. We also don't know if it's just in this region, but... We see Nicolas Cage with his two sons, and then we know that there's like a compound not too far away with several people who seem like they have a lot of supplies. And they're the, the Mr. and Mrs. Rose. I kept thinking of Schitt's Creek. Oh. And Moira. <laughs> and they have a daughter. Mm-hmm. Uh, Charlotte, played by Sadie Sabral. Who apparently is like, has a little relationship with one of the boys. Mm -hmm. Tom? Uh, yes, Thomas. So... I like I guess they're just living until and this is confusing to me because I don't know if part of the post-apocalyptic environment are these creatures because we're told 15 years later but then all of a sudden now the creatures are coming up from under the ground yeah I'm sure I'm unsure if that was like a new thing a, a new development their natural habitat or they've just discovered that but I mean I, I, well did you finish with the synopsis yet? no okay. so then everything culminates in uh, 
the the creatures that are coming up from the ground and they kill almost they, they kill everyone in the movie except the two boys and the girl and then we see the girl and the two boys ride off into the sunset to start a new life and they have to do that because their house was destroyed yes the dad nicholas cage sort of sacrificed himself to blow up the house to kill that group of creatures although i don't know what that resolves like are were those the only creatures on earth like they set off into the sunset to be a dysfunctional throuple yeah uh yes it's unclear because 15 years have passed so if this is the only threat and these creatures are only now just discovering how to dig up under these people's houses. I don't understand how the military, some kind of human uh, uh, Force. forces haven't gotten together to eradicate them. Yeah, these creatures don't seem so difficult to eradicate. So they can't have been the reason why the world is shut down. So then it makes me even more curious, like what happened that we're in this state? And then on top of that, now we have these like, alien-like creatures. It's almost like the village, <laughs> if there actually were creatures uh, harassing the white people. Well, there... I mean, this movie reminded me of so many things. It's so derivative. Uh, the one that immediately came to mind was that Joel Edgerton film, It It Comes at Night. And then I thought, well, and then like Leave the World Behind, uh -huh. A Quiet Place, Light of My Life with Casey Affleck. Which she directed, yeah. In the Earth. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are just so many movies where it's like, End of the world, super vague, don't know why, we're in a rural area, they're doing their day-to-day -day routine until something happens they have to overcome, and then in the end we see them sort of like walk off to safety, but really are they safe? So the reason these kind of movies don't appeal to me compared to like, you know, if I think about something like 28 Days Later or War of the World, things where it's like this could be the end of humanity, but then we do something to give the audience hope like like we won and we're gonna be okay but these types of movies there is no okay mm -hmm. these three kids who ride off in their little go-kart it's just gonna be a, like the same is gonna happen somewhere else so it feels kind of hopeless and then it's vague I, and i feel like, like <laughs> we've seen so many darker more disturbing visions i just watched uh, no blade of grass from 1970 and that film is a lot more heavy hitting than this and or, or even leave the world behind. It, 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 just how um, humanity erodes upon itself. Like, you almost don't really need any creatures. But to me, for me, in this film, the creatures are the best part of it because they look pretty cool. Well, and then, of course, it's like, how do we make them different? These creatures, they do this thing. So you already mentioned, they sort of have, like, camouflage where, like, the top of their head is, like, a fake face. And then when they... Because really their heads look like some kind of big bird. Or a platypus or... Yeah, yeah, something like that. But then the effect of them getting ready to attack is almost like a rattlesnake where they clap their big jaws. Mm -hmm. And it's it's pretty violent and effective. Which must be uh, a mechanism for their species to cause fear because it also allows them to be killed easily because they hesitate too long. Right, because they never strike immediately. It's like when they're ready to strike, they kind of clap their head a few yeah. times. But then it's like, bam, I shot you. But I did think it was effective and, you know, like in an interesting way. Mm -hmm. And then they appear, we see what happens to Mrs. Rose is uh, they seem to lay some kind of... Uh, it seems like they maybe use humans for incubated, incubation as well. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm just going to go through my notes. In the opening, we're supposed to get like a de-aged Nicolas Cage. And I thought that... <laughs> you can't just slap some, uh, as Lady Bunny says, uh, vigorous brown hair on an older man and expect that to be it. Yeah, he looked kind of crazy. Because then when we flash forward 15 years, I thought he looked more youthful, <laughs> like in his normal... More youthful, but still where is he... Where is he finding that hair dye? Yeah, where is he getting hair dye in this condition? 15 years on, where but, are they finding their toilet paper? Okay, I think Nicolas Cage is miscast. Mm -hmm. So we see the, the, the family, the dad and the two boys, having dinner. And they're talking, and they all sort of take their knives, and they stab them into the table, and they say, we are men. Yeah. Or are we not men? So then I got the sense like, oh, this is, you know, like the story between the, this family is that this father is showing his sons the way of the world because they've never known the world um, any other way. And then we get a couple of scenes where he's teaching them how to do things, where he's showing them how to fix their little golf cart. And then he's showing them how to like, I think, dig up some root vegetable or something. 
And I just, Nicolas Cage performing these scenes felt very odd. Like it was, I feel like we needed a different actor, maybe someone a little more rugged mm -hmm. and maybe appealing. You know, like say Joel Edgerton in Comet yes. Night. And I'm saying that because I feel like for this to make sense to the audience, like this character needs to be aspirational. So then his two sons who are, because one seems a little more puny than the other. And they're I, supposedly twins. And they're supposed to be twins, but they don't look alike. But well, which what, is po fraternal twins. Which is sure. possible. But yeah, I don't think Nicolas Cage fit this role. Well, he always seems kind of erratic and anxious. And um, like, y you know, we're very used to him kind of going off the rails at a moment's notice. And he, he just has that uh, energy that would suggest that he isn't the most capable to live, live, live right. this. Now, I will say, halfway through the movie, he gets injured mm -hmm. fighting one of the creatures. So he's incapacitated for like 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. He doesn't come back until the very end of the film to sort of sacrifice himself to blow up the house. Although how he would know to do that or what, I, it wasn't really necessary. There's this motif of beetles. We see beetles several times, beetles is in the bug, mm -hmm. several times. And I, I'm assuming they're related to these creatures in a way. It seems like they're feeding on them almost like uh, the parasitically. Maybe, because when one of the creatures is killed, we see that there are beetles coming out of it. Yeah, like they're rot. So that made me think maybe they're sickly, kind of like the aliens and signs where these creatures have realized that this is not uh, a sustainable environment for them. I think the strongest moments were the, the two scenes you mentioned when we first see the creatures. Mm -hmm. One is in a cave, and it, we see it by, like, candlelight, basically. So... Yeah, that was creepy. Like, very creepy. We paused it a few times to look again, and it is very effective. There's another scene where Joseph is asleep in, like, an accent chair in a room, and we see one of the creatures stick its arm in the window, and the way the arm unfolds, and then the finger gets really long, which looked super cool. Mm -hmm. But then it's like, if the creature has that kind of capability... I don't know. I, I, I just wish I understood a little bit more about anything in this it's movie. It's just like they just scratch at these people's door every night and can't get in. But we find out that Joseph was pretending to be, to be asleep so that he could capture one of the creatures. For what reason, I don't really know. If a teenage boy can capture one of these creatures, how after 15 years? That, right, right. Um, the, the creature, um, I thought, kind of like its fake face reminded me of that scary vision in Insidious with Barbara Hershey. Uh-huh, yeah. It, it kind right. of was creepy like that. It's right, he's right there. <laughs> There's a moment where the score you said reminded you of if Philip Glass had remixed an Adele song. Yeah, <laughs> it felt like Philip Glass's instrumental version of Adele, yeah. Which was, I mean, I did enjoy it. The 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 soundtrack, the score is composed by Kristen Gundred of Dum Dum Girls, because Brewer has done some music videos for them, and Josh Martin, who's also a, a musician. So I, I think the music and the cinematography are, are kind of standouts for uh, this a lo-fi post-apocalyptic film. We see Joseph dissect the creature that he trapped and ultimately had to kill. And I was hoping that was going to lead to something more yeah. But it really is just him sort of playing with it, and then that's it. I'm just pulling apart some guts. Very Jeffrey Dahmer. Okay, so then the these types of movies where it's like, oh, it's been, in this case, 15 years where I guess they don't, like, they've had to live in isolation and grow their own food. And how do they have medicine? How do they, what, the, the, the daughter who likes Tom... Uh -huh. Charlotte. That girl has perfect teeth, perfect skin. Great hair, yeah. Like, where is she getting... <laughs> I always find it very distracting. Also, if they don't have access to, like, processed food and sugar, like, they're just eating meat and vegetables, shouldn't everyone be very lean? And the kids are, but the adults... Everybody looks too they, healthy. They look this. normal, like mm -hmm. an average American. They, it, they, it just doesn't track to be. They are Especially well, Nicolas Cage. They're well kept. But even <laughs> Mrs. Rose is like, you look very well groomed to live in live here right now yes so tom says after their dad nicholas cage gets his arm hurt he says well let's go to the neighbors because they have a bunch of stuff and see if maybe they can help dad and joseph is like no you know they're not going to help us that's a dumb idea but tom insists so the three of them go and that family is 
which reminded me of Leave the World Behind. They're like, no, we only have enough supplies for us. And the daughter goes, that's not true. We have a lot of space here. They can all stay here. And they say, no, but if Tom wants to stay, he can. And then I thought we would get some backstory on that. Well, it's just like Tom has been doing some work for the Roses. It seems pro, pro bono. I don't know what he's getting out of that. But it's clear that they know that there's an attraction between the kids. And then the dad gets super upset when he finds them kissing. It's like, well, aren't you letting this teenage boy stay here because you're, you're he's going to have a kid with your daughter or something? Right. Aren't you thinking about these right. things? What dad wouldn't think like, hell no, I'm not going to let this teenage boy my daughter like stay with us. <laughs> like, like how? Did, and, and then like you said, when he does catch them kissing he gets really upset it's just like i would love to see a very realistic portrayal of people that are honest and blunt about survival like because you asked a question early on like did these boys get to talk about the birds and the bees <laughs> yeah like the, where is where are these kind of conversations happening and then um when he's a when thomas is alone in charlotte's bedroom with her and she's like explaining to him what a rocking horse is and he gets snippy with her because she he thinks it's patronizing it's like well yeah how would you know what a rocking horse is yeah, I, I feel like maybe a more inventive approach to these types of movies, since there are so many that are so similar, is maybe let's start branching off into like, what what would this environment be like if you have to talk about, you know, like make it more of sort of like a character study ver rather than like, oh, we have to battle something that ultimately is not going to lead to salvation. Well, like, <laughs> the, the elements, including the development of the story, the character development, uh, and, and how these actors look, you know, none of those things really add up. To, like, Thomas, Maxwell Jenkins looks like he's uh, trying out for the football team. Yeah, he looks like the popular kid in high school. The only one who really looked like they fit is Joseph. Because he's kind of greasy and skinny and, you know, like, okay, I, I could see this kid not having all the things he needs. But mm -hmm. anyway, the after Tom gets caught, he gets caught, like, after he gets caught kissing the girl, then he leaves with a bottle of medicine. A bottle of pills. So a bottle of pills. These 15-year-old pills? So are they 15? And then also, it, again, leave the world behind where it's like, what kind of medication cures like a blown off hand? Like what, like are these antibiotics, pain medications? I don't know. But he gets caught by some of the people who live on this compound and they say, oh, an eye for an eye. We're going to shoot off your foot since you tried to run away with our stuff. And he's insisting like, no, old girl said I could have it. And then right as they're about to shoot his foot off, Guess who saves the day? These creatures come up from the ground and basically kill everyone who was trying to harm him. And that allows him to go back with his brother. How fortuitous. So then that's when the girl, because now her family's all dead. So she goes with Tom back to Joseph. And then they had formulated a plan that they were going to basically, this made me laugh so hard. Their plan is to get all the creatures into the house and then blow up the house. But the kids, are supposed to go in this freezer, like this empty freezer, to protect them from the explosion. See, now what would have, been, would have made me have respect for this film is if, you know, because I was told as a kid, don't go playing in uh, abandoned refrigerators because you might get stuck. That would have been good. They got stuck. Oh, yeah. yeah. But we see the house blow up because Nicolas Cage sort of locks the door behind them so the creatures can't chase them. And then when the explosion happens, we see the, the camera's giving us the perspective of being inside the freezer. And it seems like that freezer got blown like across the yard. There's there are flames. <laughs> that was unbelievable. Into... Well, yeah. But it looks kind of cool. Sure. Uh, oh God, the girl after so like daylight comes and the house is smoking and the creatures are dead, and she gets up and gives a little speech. And I thought that speech was so corny. And then the way she ends it reminded me of Always and Forever, Alyssa. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, her whole little flirtation with Thomas is cringy because they go off in the field one day and she's like, look at this string that uh, demarcated where I could leave the yard as an eight-year-old. That's This string has been, this rope's been there for eight years just lying around. Well, also, again, wh what was happening? Like, so d did these creatures always stay? I'm... I, I think I'm frustrated with this film because I'm just tired of like ne like all these movies. It's like no answers, and sometimes it's fine, but like this one gives us not like almost nothing. She she plays a game with Thomas, like let's play crappy apocalypse, where in one minute you have to come up conceive a story from start to finish about the the day the world ended. How is it possible that only 15 years have passed and no one knows the history of how we got here today? 
That, that they have to play a game where they make or, up. Or that they ha it's like so normalized, like this is life now. This is just going to be it. Like, what? Or maybe they do know, but they just play this game for funsies. But then as the audience, it's like, couldn't we just get the real story? Because the fake story they make up is like there were these bugs that infected everyone. And it's like, that could have been the story. That could have been. The, like, are And so all those creatures are humans that turned because they're infected. Like, give us that. Something. I, I don't know. My final note is they ride around this golf cart. And there are a couple of interesting shots where it looks like the camera. It's like a GoPro looking thing with like fisheye bubble effect. I don't know what you call it. I thought that looked cool. But every time they're on that go-kart, they have a dog. That poor, and that poor dog has to chase them. And the final scene when they ride off into the sunset to go to Wyoming or I don't know where they're going, that they call the dog like, come on. And it's like, is that dog going to run miles? And <laughs> that, yeah, how far are you going? <laughs> the, to, doing homeward bound on this poor animal. I know, like, poor yeah. thing. What else would you like to say about this movie? Nothing. I mean, Cage produced it. I'm sure that his inclusion is maybe why it eventually got made. But uh, yeah, I don't know. This just felt uh, diminished in, in a lot of ways to me. I, I don't know. I'm, now I feel like I need to change my score. What would you give this movie? I'm um, two and a half. If, I, if as much care had been taken with the story as the creatures, I think we'd be in good shape. I guess I'll give it two and a half out of five. It's okay. And if you have Shudder, I guess you should watch it. Anything else? No. Join us on Patreon and listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs> Uh-huh.